Well, good morning, Cameron. Uh, very glad to be with you today. I am, uh, well, I'm on the mend. I've, I've still got some residual congestion, and I'm sorry about that. You can probably hear it. Good morning. It is January 28th. Very glad to be with you today. Let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this morning and this time to be together. We pray that you would guide us in our reading and aid us in our understanding. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, conform us to the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Forgive us of our sins, O Lord. Wash us clean of all inequity and unrighteousness. Move in our hearts, Lord, that we might be faithful and joyfully obedient to your commandments and ever mindful of the laws and lessons of Jesus Christ. Bind us together as your church and help us to love one another. We ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, uh, today's first reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Uh, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, from your midst, from your brethren. <clears throat> Him you shall hear according to all you desire to the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me uh, see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What have they, <clears throat> what they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak my word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Paul writes, Now concerning things offered to idols, uh, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, there is only one God and Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus uh, sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make another brother stumble. The word of God for the people of God. I might scoot up just a bit. Our gospel reading for this week uh, is St. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Uh, then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, 
for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And then they were all amazed, so that they so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For what authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, I want to begin uh, this, well, to look at the passage from Deuteronomy seems um, a rather clear uh, prophecy given uh, sort of through Moses uh, that the Lord promises and that will, there will be prophets like Moses who come up from amongst the Hebrews. And of course, we look as Christians to Jesus as the one who comes as even greater than Moses. But, um, you know, many prophets uh, came in Israel's history, certainly between Moses and the coming of Jesus. Uh, uh, maybe notably John the Baptist right before Jesus, This John the Baptist, the prophet is sent to point directly to Jesus and make straight the way of the Lord. But many, uh, but he comes with this warning uh, in verse 20, but the prophet who presumes to speak my word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And that's a very dire warning that um, the role of a prophet to speak for God and to speak in God's name, uh, and to say, thus says the Lord, that is a uh, bold statement, and you better be sure, you better be very sure that you are in fact hearing from God and not speaking out of turn about your own opinions or preferences. Um, the main way we can ensure that uh, in the church is are you saying what is absolutely in accordance with the scriptures? Are you speaking uh, what is in line with the scriptures? If uh, someone is claiming to speak on God's behalf and what they say is not aligned with the scriptures, uh, then that should more than raise an eyebrow. And we should be very, very suspicious as to whether or not they are actually speaking for God, because God's not going to contradict himself, uh, not at all. So uh, I think that adequately looks at the Deuteronomy passage. And I want to, I'd like to start with the gospel where Jesus uh, goes to Capernaum and um, he entered one of the synagogues up there on the Sabbath uh, and taught. And so Jesus is basically preaching and, and teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, and he had a lot of authority. He was uh, very good. And now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he sort of cried out, let us alone. Now, I think it's worth noting that the man with the unclean spirit was in the synagogue. He's in the church. So uh, do not presume that uh, the evil of the world and even that which is diabolical is not going to be found in the church. The church is not necessarily an insulator of that which is evil. It comes right in. Um, so uh, he cries out, uh, let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, you're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet 
and come out of him. I, I think there's something to note here. The devil, or the demon, I should say, in this, in this instance, when he yells at Jesus, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. As if um, calling Jesus out uh, for being the Messiah uh, was some kind of a trump card, so to speak, to the demon. Oh, I'll rat you out. I'll blow up your spot. I'll let people know who you are. And there are several passages where Jesus is sort of attempting to hide, kind of not let people know, not just announce freely who he is. And so the demon is using this, uh, it seems, uh, as a bit of leverage uh, to, let, to let, you know, I'll, I'll tell the people who you are. I'll blow your cover. Um, and you get this sense that the demon is inside the synagogue and the demon's leverage that he's trying to use against Jesus is that I'll tell people in here that you're the son of God. You would think that the people in the church would be delighted to know that he's the son of God in their midst. You would think that those in the church would be elated that the Messiah was there to teach and preach to them that morning. But it doesn't seem to be the case. It seems rather that the demon um, is rather more comfortable at home, if you will, in the synagogue, whereas Jesus' is concern, perhaps, at least the demon thinks he'll be concerned, that the identity of the Messiah would be found out within the synagogue. What does that tell us about the synagogue? What does that say about the community in that church that, uh, that the demon feels quite comfortable in the synagogue and that the, that the son of God might need to keep his identity a secret in the synagogue? It goes back to that idea that when Christ was born in Bethlehem, uh, of course, uh, Herod was greatly concerned, but all of Jerusalem was concerned right along with him. Um, it, it makes this question about the nature and community of the church. Would we be more comfortable as the church with a demon in our midst than we would be with the Messiah in our midst? Would we be more uh, comfortable with evil in our presence rather than the holy in our presence? And I think that's at least worth asking. Um, of course, Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of them. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So uh, they're not sort of in disbelief, like, oh, there's no such thing as demons. or uh, They're like, no, this, we see these things and he knocked them out. Uh, in Mark's gospel, we will find that exorcisms and the expulsion of unclean spirits are a regular part of Jesus' ministry. This, this happens part and parcel. Um, in Matthew and Luke, by comparison, more often his ministry is regularly focused on uh, preaching, teaching, and healing. But in Mark, Mark adds this exorcism component as sort of a regular part of Jesus' ministry. He's always sort of exercising unclean spirits. Um, so that, that question of um, what are we tolerating in our churches? And when the Son of God and the true gospel is preached, what is the reaction? Are we so conformed to the world that the demons feel quite at home in our churches. 
and that the Son of God would almost have to come in surreptitiously in order to be in our midst. Where are our hearts? Are they more attuned to the rhythms and standards of the world, or are we seeking holiness such that we are offended by evil in our presence, or have we come too comfortable and accustomed to it? That is a question. I want to get to this passage in Corinthians, which I think is very important. Uh, one of the issues that Paul is dealing with in Corinth, of course, is trying to turn these Corinthians from pagan Gentiles into Christians. And, and not many of them have the background in Judaism and understand the Old Testament and the law very well at all. Uh, they have been converted, Paul will tell us, mainly by signs and wonders, and they don't have, they didn't grow up going to Sunday school, as it were. And so he's having to instruct them on some very basic things. Now, if we were to look at Acts chapter 15, we would find <clears throat> that the apostles in Jerusalem, when discussing how to incorporate the Gentiles into the church, had basically decided that Gentiles did not need to be circumcised. Baptism would be sufficient. And this is a tremendous moment, a tremendous change, that people were now going to be incorporated into the covenant of God, into full membership in the church through faith in Jesus Christ, and that baptism would become uh, the new sign of that covenant sacrament. You can imagine the egalitarian uh, uh, implications that not just men could participate in the covenant, but men and women could both be baptized. So that's great, but there were caveats and very firm, primarily four. Um, you could not eat meat sacrificed to idols. You could not uh, drink blood. You could not eat anything that had been strangled. Again, sacrificed to idols, so was the blood. And you had to keep all the sexual uh, rules from the Old Testament. So this often comes up in discussion about, let's say, Leviticus 18.22, which gives us pretty strong prohibition against homosexual conduct. Um, and people often point out, well, later in the chapter, um, they also have rules about slavery. So surely we could disregard all that. Well, that's not the case at all. Uh, Acts 15 clearly states we have to keep the rules about sexual morality and propriety. The rules about slavery are not required to be kept by new Christians. It's right there in Acts 15, very simple. Uh, people sort of act like the church hasn't been dealing with these questions for 2,000 years. Um, which is a very ignorant position to take. But regardless, in this instance, uh, eating meat that was sacrificed to idols was absolutely prohibited uh, for Gentile converts. And the Corinthians were struggling with this. Um, and Paul's got to get them in line. Paul's got to explain to them in some way they can understand if you don't conform to this rule, you could be excommunicated. Now, they may not have the full background to understand the idea of problems with idolatry and uh, spiritual warfare and the issues of these evil spirits and what could happen to the soul of a person if they're participating in these idolatrous rituals that would involve eating this meat, um, all of that's probably rather advanced for the people of Corinth and these new converts. Paul's told them there is only one true God. And so by their thinking, these are false gods. They're just not anything to worry about. So why can't I eat this meat? And Paul realizes they are not prepared for all the in-depth analysis and all the biblical study that it would require to understand this in a mature way. Paul simply got to get them to obey the rule. 
Otherwise, they could be excommunicated and they'd shut the church down. So he has to tell them that, oh, those of you who are wise enough and strong enough um, and know better about these idols, you need to be good examples for those who are weak and superstitious and just don't eat the meat. So set a good example. Um, the ones who are, as Paul puts it, weak and superstitious are actually the ones who are uh, probably more spiritually attuned and, and more dedicated to following the rules. Um, the ones who Paul calls strong um, and smart, those are the ones who are probably uh, ignorant of all that could possibly go wrong. Um, this is important about rules in Christianity. This is an important overarching point. There are many times in the life of the church when people think they understand why the rules are important, why they matter, and then they think that, well, we're smarter than that, and the rules no longer apply to me. Um, these are often, I'll be honest, my understanding is these are mostly usually the people who are the most ignorant of scriptures, who are the most willing to cast off the regulations of the scriptures. Um, God does not make rules just for arbitrary reasons. Um, he certainly has his reasons, and I trust that God loves us and wants what is good for us. And so uh, I have to trust God and trust the rules and the prohibitions uh, against sin. And therefore, following God's commandments is good for me in ways that I may not even truly understand yet. Learning obedience to God is a virtue in and of itself. Being set apart from the world in my behavior and rituals is good for me in and of itself. But many of the prohibitions uh, that, that the Bible gives us about and that Christianity tells us what to do and what not to do, uh, we have found out are actually very truly good for us. They're not good for us. Um, so, so following God's commandments is an act of trusting God. It's an act of trusting God that he knows better for us even than we know for ourselves. When I disobey God and do what I want to do because I think I know best, that is again choosing my own will over God's will. And it's not only an act of disobedience and sin, it's an act of hubris and arrogance to think that I'm the boss of me and I know better for Oliver than God does. It's just folly. Obedience is submitting not just to the will of God, but to the wisdom of God. And it is an act of trusting his love and grace and mercy for each one of us. Um, when I tell my boys not to do something, and they disobey and do it. Sometimes they get hurt. <clears throat> if they had listened to their father, they would have been fine. That's a basic idea, but I think the lesson holds true. Um, sometimes, if we have an all-knowing, ever-present, omnipresent father, he knows better for us than we do. Trust God. Avoid sin. Trust God. Seek God holiness. Trust God. Live a life of virtue. Obey the scripture and the commandments of the church. All right. Have a great week. We love you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.